go ahead and hit record. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for this session on navigating D2C sales and e-commerce for early stage startups. This event comes to you via a Northeastern collaboration with the McCarthy's Venture Mentoring Network, the Northeastern Alumni Relations Department, and Northeastern's Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative. I am Wendy Eaton, the Associate Director of the McCarthy's Venture Mentoring Network, and I will be your moderator today. I would like to remind you that this session is being recorded, so please keep yourself on mute and post any questions that you have in the chat. After the panel discussion, we're gonna open it up for Q&A for about 15 to 20 minutes. So share any specific questions then, and we'll get to them at that point. Now let's get to the good part. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to our panelists to introduce themselves before we jump into some Q&A. Um, so Jamie, would you like to kick us off with your intro? Sure, thanks, Wendy. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Dooley. I am a Northeastern uh, University alum. We'll just say from the late 90s. Why don't we go with that? I don't want to, although I mean, pretty much I'm old. Uh, I am a management consultant. I work for a company called TPG, which is, it stands for the partnering group. And uh, I, I'm in the e-commerce and retail practices there. I've been in retail for about 25 years. I was a brick and mortar merchant for Target and Staples and was also on the leadership team for Wayfair and worked at Dunkin' Donuts headquarters, as well as uh, more recently was an e-commerce vice president at Dr. Pepper. So looking forward to talking to everyone. Thanks for having me. Sorry about that. Having some unmute issues. Leslie, could you please introduce yourself next? There we go. I was stuck on you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Leslie Motla. I uh, also, I got my MBA at uh, Northeastern, also kind of a long time ago. Uh, I am at a, currently at a company called Butcher Box, which is based in Boston, and we're a D2C sustainable food company. Uh, and prior to that, I have uh, worked in e-commerce in fashion, sharing economy, technology, um, with a focus largely in product management and customer experience. And so I'm very excited to be here and uh, uh, meet everyone today. Thank you. All right, last but not least, Tyann, over to you. Yes, hi, I'm Tyann. I uh, graduated in 2006, I'll say it. I'm quite old as well. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Aviva, a clean family skincare brand on a mission to help families manage their sensitive skin easier. Um, we actually are a number one release on Amazon, the brand itself. We, we were one of the first to go Amazon first strategy in 2020, 2021. We were also Amazon Choice, um, and we, we have seen great success using that strategy to go Amazon first, uh, which is traditionally not what a startup brand would do. Uh, they would normally go D2C, so I, I'm definitely uh, going to talk a little bit about that um, as part of my perspective on whether uh, on the e-com space itself. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome, panelists. Thank you so much for being here today. So I want to kick off our conversation here. Um, just by kind of setting the foundation, and Jamie, I'd love for you to cover this, of what is the basic e-commerce formula that startups should be thinking about when they enter this space? Sure. So this is a really simple answer. So it's, it's, a, it's a simple equation. So we're going to go back to algebra. So e-commerce sales is equal to traffic times conversion times average order value. And when you're planning a D2C business or you're looking at e-commerce in general, there are only three levers you're going to be able to pull to drive sales, traffic, conversion, and average order value. Now, there are lots of ways to drive traffic, or there's lots of ways to drive conversion, and then even more to try and build basket size. So average order value, or AOV, is a function of you know, how many items are in uh, the basket online, as well as the average selling price. Uh, some would argue that you should also be looking at frequency. That's a big part of what will, will factor into customer lifetime value. But again, the, 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 the only three level, levers in that equation, traffic conversion and average order value. And I'd say probably almost everyone I work with, clients who have D2C businesses or uh, individuals in e-commerce, 
they spend about 90% of their time and resources on traffic and conversion. So out of those three levers, most of the time you'll spend and your resources will be on those first two, traffic and conversion. Thank you, Jamie. And diving a little bit deeper, um, Leslie, could you comment a little bit on what are some of the fundamentals of getting started in the D2C space? What should folks expect and, and build on? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it is really about the fundamentals and thinking about the fundamentals. And that would be um, basically, you know, really refining your product or service and getting feedback on it, you know, before you launch. Uh, Feedback includes how people perceive it or what they like about your product so that you can kind of take that feedback and use that in your marketing and content um, and really understanding what, how you're differentiating yourself. Like, why are you different than all the alternatives that probably exist uh, in your particular space? And so really focusing on those fundamentals of like a good product, a good service, getting feedback before you even launch. Um, and then your positioning and messaging around it, because that's going to really feed into your marketing and your ability to kind of generate traffic and, and get people interested in your in your product. So I uh, and those things, and also uh, you know we'll talk later about how you launch, whether you launch you know like on a Shopify site or Amazon or whatever. But for me, also the customer experience and things beyond the product, maybe. Um, questions people might have uh, about your product. So thinking through kind of the, the journey you want people to have with your product as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And so once you have those fundamentals set, what are some strategies that founders can use early on to get traction? And Tyann, I don't know if you want to jump in here since you have that experience um, and just share a little yep. bit more. I think it's really important to like, um, just going back to what Leslie said, you really have to hone in on your messaging, your value proposition. Why are you so different from anybody else uh, in the market? I would even suggest that, I, and I did this, actually just stand in front of you, the aisle that you're trying to compete at, literally in the retail store itself, and see how, observe how people are choosing the product. Is it price and things? Have a just like, random conversation with people, pretend that you're buying and you need their recommendation. I do this all the time. Even now, I actually do that all the time. So that actually really helped you to hone your thing. Branding is really a key um, indicator. Now, don't, if you're only going to be in D2C early on, you know, people are just going to see the visualization of your product. So I think a lot of time um, that we, the early startups don't really focus on the visualization, the branding, the marketing, the packaging. That all really adds to your uniqueness. I mean, and people won World Packaging Award. Um, and all we did was really hone in on the fact that our category is quite blah itself and how we represent ourselves. I mean, we want to be a modern, clean brand, but a fun and playful one. So that's the, the position that we went with ourselves. Uh, so. Some of the other thing is to really build and work on your PR, your influencer samplings early on. Now, don't come, the startups founder should not confuse PR with marketing. PR is for validation, to get your name out, to start the, the wheels rolling, because that's like the top of the funnel approach. Then you really go in with the marketing that drives the sale. So how are you approaching marketing? Are you doing influencer samplings, which... I'm still on the fence about that. Um, are you using Facebook with the new IOs? That's kind of tricky as well. So have, figure out what is your marketing to maximize every single dollars really helps with the traction itself. And then from a e-com D2C side, you really want to make, you try to optimize your website, your listing to make it as frictionless as possible in the consumer journey to buy your product. Um, and I think that's something that you'll continue to do all the time, regardless. And I think just back to what Ambiba did, I mean, we were just really lucky. We launched um, a year, we launched in 2021, but then we won, then we started winning awards right away for our product. I mean, we won Parents Magazine Best Skin Care for Kids three, three months right after we launched. So that that was what really propelled us into more name brand name recognition. And then we continue to win all these um, parenting awards and being, and that actually then 
uh, helps us to continue to be in magazines and have the um, and getting that recognition itself. Now that helps with the early traction, and then you have to focus on actually marketing and getting the consumer down the journey to buy the products. Thank you. Um, Jamie and Leslie, do you have any other thoughts about strategies for early traction to build on what Tiana shared? Yeah, I'd, I'd start with building on what Tiana talked about value proposition. And what it's just as we're thinking about D2C, you just have to remember you own your company and you have a choice on where you're going to want your products to show up right now. And retail is one area where you can you have sites that are getting hundreds of millions of of visitors more than you're probably going to get in your first year or two by a D2C. Yeah. So it's this, you're, you're asking yourself, can I change consumer behavior? Can I get enough consumers to come to my website when they're used to shopping on Amazon, they're used to shopping on Target and Walmart and, and, and other retailer sites? So pressure test your value proposition. It's, it's important to have it, but uh, you know, I'll use an example. I'm not going to name them but, uh, because they're... they're uh, they're pretty big, but they're, they're the number one cookie brand in the US. And they spent tens of millions of dollars on D2C. They had a value proposition, but it never really, it, it wasn't, it didn't resonate with the consumer coming to their D2C site just to get all kinds of test flavors when really the consumer just wanted that one or those one or two flavors from, from that brand. And they were used to getting it at their grocery store. That D2C initiative really didn't take off. So it's important to have a value proposition, but it's also important to think about, and re does that resonate with the consumer? Is the consumer really gonna wanna come to my site and buy this from me versus just going to a traditional retailer? So pressure testing your value proposition is number one. Second is size the opportunity. And that a lot has to do with, with startups is how much inventory can you actually create if things take off? And then what are the economics of that? Do you have the ability create tens of thousands of units or are you capped at 5,000 units per month? And you know, is, is that gonna be economical? And then the third is to plan your strategy around the resources you're gonna to need to be able to, to hit your goals. And what, what we talk about a lot is that there are multiple centers of excellence to running a DDC business and an e-commerce business and you really need to think about all of them. So it's about products and availability. That's the first one. I'm gonna, am I gonna have enough product online to make people want to come to my site. And, and then it's about the consumer experience when they get to your site. Can you build a great online experience? It's about using marketing, that's your third center of excellence to drive traffic to the site. The, the fourth would be supply chain and operations. Fifth is technology. The sixth is business intelligence and data. And a lot of people open D2C businesses because they want a closer relationship with the consumer. Do you have the technology to actually mine the, the reporting and data to actually turn those, those, those data points from your consumers into insights that can drive your business forward. And then the last area of, or center of excellence is people and partnerships. Who's responsible for what? Do you have enough people in place to hit all the areas you're gonna to need to hit to drive your, your D2C sales forward? I'm gonna, can I just add something there? I also think, you know, I, maybe we're jumping a little bit here, but in terms of strategy wise, you also have to consider did your channel strategy based on your cap capability at that moment, which is what Jamie was alluding to um, as well. If you're only gonna have like 5,000 and you're like the only startup person, um, I think it might be, and very limited fun, then maybe selling to small boutiques, you know, offline to start to really understand if your product is going to resonate with retailers. And then on from an online, maybe it's just a sh simple Shopify website. That's all you need and you can fulfill on things yourself, can copy standard. You don't have to, you don't have to have this beautiful polished look and feel right away. Focus on making, on figuring out and testing. It's one of those things where you constantly have to A-B test every single message as and then price point, what's work, what's not gonna work. Um, and when you're much smaller and you focus on one channel instead, you'll be more successful in, in getting the results and implementing those, uh, those learning faster. Thank yeah, you. just, uh, I guess one thing to add to that is Tan kind of um, alluded to this is, uh, and I'm thinking of a real, you know, startup situation where you are leveraging um, 
getting people to try your product, you know, in our case at Butcher Box, it's a food product. So we had, you know, we started with a lot of chefs and um, very small influencers and health, you know, people who are really into health and getting those people to try your product, write about your product, talk about your product, those small wins start to really, really add up and give you kind of the, um, the, the uh, you know, points from people to say how great your product is that you can leverage elsewhere. Basically. Actually, that's a really good point because that would be where you first think about your, well, you work on your value proposition is, are those, can you win those people who have seen it all, who have seen it all, gets inundated with products. If they, if you can get them to be excited about your products, then you know you, you have something and then you can move forward and then kind of, and then use them to um, test your, your messaging, your value proposition. When Aviva started, we went with doctors, we went with pediatricians, doulas and moms influencer, we would be sending sample. We, we are very heavy on the sampling at Ambiva, but we would just send samples out. And then we would get all these crazy feedback about how, you know, this and that. And then we were like, okay, but why we were doing that, we were testing different messages, messaging and provide your proposition to each demo, each group of, of, uh, of influencer mm -hmm. and each, each target group, sorry. So I think that if you're talking about like early traction, like whether or not you, you think you're, you have a winning product thing, that might be a really good and not quite expensive way to test as well. Um, and then you can use those as testimonies later on, by the way, which is very important for a D2C site just to have reviews and testimonies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, um, thank you all for your input on that. Kind of switching gears a little bit, what are some common mistakes and pitfalls that D2C founders make that you should try to avoid? Um, and I'll open this up to the panel, whoever wants to jump in and share. I'm, ha I'm happy to start. I think uh, I get, it's probably not just D2C, it's everyone. It's like a lack of focus. You know, it's really easy to get distracted by kind of shiny objects or just uh, different people who maybe have different interests in your business that don't align with what you're trying to do. So I would say that's just, you know, focus is a really important thing. Um, also, I think even just the people, you know, even if you're hiring someone, hire, you need to think about hiring. If you're, you're, every hire that you make early on needs to kind of up your game, you know, by 10 times. So you really, you know, need to be pretty meticulous about you're hiring and who you're, who you're hiring. Um, I think those, you know, the, those, and, and to, you know, Jamie's point, it's like, start measuring things early, use your data early because your data is going to then feed into your strategies of what's working and what's not working. So just start, people often will kind of use that at later or start thinking about it later. It's something that should be thought of like at the get-go. Thanks, Leslie. Jamie, do you have thoughts in this area? Yeah, well, it, it's funny you, you mentioned not fo uh, focus, Leslie, because that's one of mine, I would say, is not focusing enough on the customer and the consumer experience. And this is, you know, a playbook out of Amazon. Amazon's way of approaching the entire business is start with the customer and work backwards. So I, I've seen a lot of D2C businesses where they're not focusing enough on what's what's the customer experience, wearing the customer's shoes throughout that entire experience, and how do you truly win the customer's consideration and, and ultimately their sales? So not focusing on the customer is number one. I'd say another one is underestimating um, how they're going to get traffic to their site and just not having a sufficient plan for how are they going to drive traffic through SEO, through paid search, through paid advertising, through social media, and knowing that that plan is going to probably change. So again, to, to piggyback on what Leslie said, it's super data-driven, so it's easy for you from week to week and month to month to sit back and look and see what's working and what's not working. But I mean, all, I would guarantee almost, I'd say most D2C sites, most e-commerce operators in general, if they have access to traffic data, that's one of the things they're, they're constantly adjusting because they don't always go according to plan and just underestimating how you're gonna get traffic to your, your site is probably another mistake that I've seen a, made a lot. Thanks, Jamie. And to, your, to that point, data at this point, when you're a D2C, it's really important and you need to, you need to um, 
review and look at it. And you can get data really easily. You can get it through your Amazon reporting if you're on AWS, like, sorry, Amazon Seller Central, or if you're on Shopify, you can just pull reports, you can see heat maps, and there's a, a ton of different type of plugins to get your data. But like for Ad and Biba, we actually look at our data on a weekly basis. So we know, we can see, you know, which demographic is actually growing quite robustly for us. And that we, and one of the things is, for example, 30% of that uh, male purchase our products. And now if you think about it, we only got really two types of product, a diapering product and an adult product, right? But before we even had an adult product, we saw that there was like a 30% of male buying our product, which tells us that fathers are really involved in today, in this modern time of uh, making those purchasing decisions. So how do you communicate to them better? Um, recommendation, most guys most uh, guys are using their text messages instead, and they like to text message each other in small groups. So how do you target that versus uh, female tend to want to get advice, particularly moms, from Facebook groups. Um, so like, and Facebook still continue to be a, a rather um, key driver for, for traffic, regardless of the IELTS uh, update itself. Um, so those are the things that startups don't really think about. It's like really, really look at the consumer journey, but also map out top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, and like the bottom of funnel approach. And that not just, we're not just talking about marketing itself, but we're talking about how you're going to interact with the consumers throughout the entire chain. And that actually will inform you and help you um, sidestep some of those potential pitfalls. Focus is really important um, a lot of time. And we, I fell into this too, by the way, because we got inbounded by like, you know, distributor from China, some South Africa wants a product. And then you're like, oh, this is so amazing, blah, blah. You know, Walmart came calling. And then when you do, you, when you run the numbers and the, your team capability to meet those, you realize you just do not have that. So really focusing on building what channel matters the most to you and focus on that first and stabilize that before you move on is really important. I think that brings us to, you know, another topic we wanted to cover, which was marketplaces. The pros and cons of marketplaces such as Amazon. Um, Tayan, I know that you've experienced this firsthand. So if you want to share a little bit about, you know, what can be great yeah. about Amazon and what cannot be so great about having your product there. Yeah. Well, there is such a proliferation of, of different type of marketplaces with Amazon being one of the biggest, followed by Walmart and Target. But the thing with Amazon is so different from other, it's just the sheer volume of searches and transaction that occurs on Amazon. It's also the easiest in terms of consumer acquisitions. People come to Amazon already with a purchase intention in mind, where they just essentially key in whatever they wanna buy is usually one of something really. So your ability to get in front of the consumer is just so much better. Uh, like from, for, for our industry, for our industry average, it's like, should be 10 to 15% in conversion rate. And a conversion rate, when we're talking about this, is really when a consumer look at your listing, the probability of the time they purchase your product. So it's like somewhere between 10 to 15 for our industry category. But on your own D2C website, that could be like 2%. So, so you have so much more effort needed to, uh, you need to put in in order to get your D2C to grow uh, in terms of profitability versus on Amazon. And Amazon is almost like a one can stop because you can then you know, use FBA for fulfillment and everything's done for you on Amazon, but there's some cautionary tales in that space. Then you have the Walmart who's now allowing you know, third party sellers to come on and, and sell the products as well. But they're, I think they're catching up to Amazon, but the search volume and the transaction is still not nowhere near what Amazon is. And then you have these specialty um, marketplaces that are more upscale, that are super niche, like Maisonette is like the anthropo, um, is very niche for high end, uh, unique, um, I call them like children and adult products. But then you have these natural ones as well. Marketplaces enable you to really get in front of a lot more people. 
and it helps with your SEO because when you search, you you know you should see the listing of all your products in all variety of places. So it actually builds legitimacy. So I highly recommend as part of your early um, e-commerce startup um, strategy is to get onto as many marketplaces as possible. One to build really build brand awareness. Now the challenge with that is, do you have the capability to manage all the of being on so many? different platforms and the ability to fulfill orders as well. Um, and some of the smaller ones um, also are quite challenging to work with uh, itself. So in terms of marketplaces, it's quite vast. I still think that Amazon is still a, one of the best in terms of ease of use and enter um, less barrier to entry. And really a one can like end to end um, sub partner if you want to go, if you want to launch a product uh, quickly. Now, here's where it gets like Amazon and all the marketplaces are really product focused. They're not brand building. So you will get a lot out of learning a lot about consumer purchasing behavior, et cetera, and data about product and being able to test price point. Amazon's also very price sensitive, by the way. So if you're like a more premium brand, that's not going to work for you. You're not going to see a lot more sales than someone who's just like even a dollar cheaper than you in that sense. Versus if you go to like a Maisonet, these specialty type of marketplaces, they're really focused on brand building um, itself. So, they're, so it really depends on what your strategy is, how fast you want to grow and whether or not you prioritize brand building over product, ship and movements of your product uh, will determine your strategy. Interesting. Um, Jamie and Leslie, do you have anything to, to add about marketplaces just from your experience? Yeah, so I, I would say, me, I wanna take a step back, just make sure everybody understands how marketplaces work is anybody can go on Amazon today, open a marketplace account and sell product from their basement or their garage. Now, that's not what Diane's doing. She's got a very sophisticated company that's doing, doing that, but it's, it's really easy. And th there's hundreds of, uh, there, there's, there's actually thousands of, of resellers that are currently selling products on Amazon through marketplace sellers. It's actually more than, more than half of their, their units sold last year came through these third-party marketplace sellers. So we call those three P sellers. Uh, the biggest, the, the biggest benefit of going through Amazon Marketplace versus D2C is what Tyann talked about, it's traffic. They do two, Amazon does 2 billion global visitors per month via their, their sites and apps. You're, you're gonna get access to much more traffic and you're gonna get to see, does my product work on the largest stage in, in all of US retail? So, I mean, traffic's huge. Um, that said, Another benefit is that you get pretty much access to a lot of good data that you wouldn't get access to selling to other retailers directly, including Amazon. So you get traffic data, you get conversion data, you get to see what works and doesn't work almost from a day-to-day -day basis where you wouldn't if you were selling by a 1P to, to Walmart or Amazon or to Target. And then you're also going to have much more control over pricing and the amount of inventory available. So that's those are the benefits. The drawbacks are that you're beholden to Amazon. You're training your consumer to go to Amazon or to other retailer sites rather than your own. And there are lots of horror stories out there where resellers have been shut down or suspended from the marketplace with no notice. So try to imagine, I mean, there are brands that sell hundreds of millions of dollars a year just on Amazon Marketplace. Imagine you're doing a million dollars a day in sales on Amazon, and then you wake up and you find out you're suspended. and your business has been shut down for an indefinite period of time. That's scary. So that's one of the drawbacks is it's very tenuous to be dependent just on Amazon for your business. And then also typically uh, the, the, the second benefit, the second drawback is your margin rate is going to be lower. When you think about your Amazon marketplace fees, which are usually about 15% of sales, add that to the cost of shipping directly to the consumer. That could be depending on the category anywhere from 10 to 20 or 30% of your sales. You have very little margin left. So margin rate is something you're going to want to keep control over if you're selling via marketplaces. But that said, margin dollars are more are just as important as margin rate. So if you're selling a hundred, a thousand X more units on Amazon versus your D2C side, who cares if you're getting 50% margin by a D2C, you're getting much more volume. 
Thanks, Jean. I would also just add quickly that Amazon marketplaces are generally what you need to be on if you're a consumer good product company, minus butcher block, because you're really different in, in sense. I'm talking about like more um, of like beauty, skincare, consumer goods, product companies. What you're seeing now is that a lot of the brands, including Target, Walmart, and also, you know, even retailers these days, they're checking you out and, and monitoring you as a brand and how well you perform on marketplaces, particularly Amazon. I mean, I had a national retailer, um, we're going to national retailer later this year, but I had a, as part of the conversation, the head of the buyer essentially told me like, we went to your Amazon listing and we read every single reviews. That's why we wanted you. So it's like, that is how important marketplaces are because you don't control it. So there's more implicit trust in the, for the retailers and actually for the buyers and consumers itself, because you can't scrub bad reviews from your website versus you can selectively put in an assortment of reviews on your own website itself. But it's, if you consider omni-channel later on, marketplaces are really good, is a good indicator for re retailers to inbound you if they think you your product is like unique, um, it's selling well, et cetera. Mm. So that's also like a, a pros, but then the con itself is that you do lose control of your um, your business. And I mean, I was just talking to the, the panel previously here. We like last month, we had two days where we were, we are, all of our listing was shut down and we were losing thousands of dollars and we had no idea why. And now, now we know, but then, you know, but luckily for us, it was just 48 hours of like the team scrambling to get it fixed. And it's all had to do with us updating uh, our listing, uh, just refreshing our listing and using a wrong choice of word that their machine just flagged and then just took us down and without notice. So that is, and with us being 80% on Amazon, you can imagine that actually hurt our, our um, month end revenue target quite a bit. So that is what Jamie is talking about, of being too dependent on, on Amazon uh, while you're, you know, working on your omni-channel strategy. Yeah. Thanks. I would add one other thing is I'm thinking about Leslie's categories, perishables and food that needs to be refrigerated. Amazon's not great at that. And you, don't, you definitely don't have access to that as an Amazon marketplace seller. So some of the categories are just not ideal for selling on Amazon. You're much better served to go through for example, Walmart Direct. Walmart, like, let's, if you're in a perishable grocery category, and you're you're looking to get access to the largest online grocer in the U.S., that's Walmart. That's not Amazon. And mm -hmm. when you think about curbside pickup, the immediacy of being able to get something not just in a day like Amazon can do, but you want it in hours and you want to make sure it's fresh and refrigerated. That's not something Amazon's really good at. That's something that grocers are good at. So depending on the category thinking about where your consumer is actually going to want to go for your product, that's 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 different. It's not always Amazon. Hmm. I think you're right there because a friend of mine who owns like a national, um, like, uh, what is it, tomato sauce brand, they were originally selling on Amazon and their, uh, their, their jars keep breaking on Amazon upon arriving. So they actually pulled, came off of Amazon until they could figure out how to, um, ship Amazon to how Amazon can ship the product without breaking like 70% of it. That mm. is, so from a perishable a point of view. I think that, you know, brings us into the, the next question, which is how can a venture really differentiate themselves in this space? It's really crowded. Um, and so Leslie, I don't know if, you know, based on your experience, you want to jump in and start with this question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, uh, it's really it is really about thinking about the like the customer journey that you want and and what's important at different parts of it and really doing the research or getting the feedback to understand the value that you are providing and reiterating that along a journey and and you know the points have been made if you're taking the marketplace strategy you're going to be very limited on what you can do with that journey. Um, that's why most of the companies that I've been at, like I was at a, a Italian shoe fashion company, right? And the brand was and the experience and the delivery and the unboxing and the customer support questions to get fit and creating the right technology for people to get the fit. All that was so, so important that 
uh, we eventually went to marketplaces, but we started, you know, our own sites because, so that we could, in fact, implement that very like high touch and and journey. So I think, um, you know, experience the, the experience and really understanding that as a differentiator, where you differentiate, um, is really really critical. And then really working that throughout your communications and uh, everything that you do, basically. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And we only have about five minutes left before we transition to the Q&A in the chat. So I wanted to throw out two more questions to the panelists. Um, and one of them is, what are investors looking for from a D2C business? Um, anyone can jump in here to share more. Well, actually, we just finished our fundraising, so I guess I'll talk about it. <laughs> and we're going back out. Uh, but um, yeah, so in Viva, we had finished our seed round of over a million dollars itself. And uh, so I can, uh, so, and that's actually not a lot, guys. It sounds a lot, but it's actually not. So what I would say that D2C is a dime a dozen right now. And actually, D2C is somewhat less popular in terms of investor, where the investor dollars are going. So you really have to have a strong value proposition of why um, you deserve that dollar. I would also say that they are looking at, um, they were looking at certain metrics. So for us being number one on Amazon in our category release itself, being Amazon choice for some of our products, being 30% conversion rate. And this goes back to what Jamie said about you know average order value, conversion and traffic. The fact that we convert at 30% of every single new orders compared to our industry standard of 15% and an increasing repeat purchase rate was incredibly strong uh, and appeal to the early investors themselves. And then tying in the fact that we won so many prestigious award, um, helps so you have to really build a story of why you are standing out because historically you know you see Warwick Parker has not been profitable you see Glossier just like laid off half of the workforce you see Peloton and all these things so people are going yes you want they want to make sure they're backing a, a really innovative unique product uh, brand but second how are you going to be profitable because if you're spending so much money getting into marketing and our, I would tell you right now, we're not profitable <laughs> because of the marketing spend we are. And this is what Jamie and I talk about in length is that you would actually need to have an omni-channel approach to become profitable itself and to really, um, to really have a really balanced um, channel strategy. But that's, these are things that investors are looking for. And I think at this point in time, Amazon continues to be a very strong indicator just because of the fact that you get so much data that you can glean and provide insights and metrics to the investors early on as a, an early indicator of how you're going to do um, and why you need the money. Um, so there's no yeah. free lunch, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you, Tyann. Um, Jamie and Leslie, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I would add that, and I know Jamie has a lot on this, but I think other some other metrics are repeat rates, like are people mm -hmm. coming back, are they buying more? Um, and again, depending on what type of retention rate, if it's like a, you know, in my case, more of a subscription. Um, so any sort of engagement types of metrics um, that you, they're also looking for that because that in, indicates longer term growth basically yeah the community building itself is really important like how are you connecting community building with your um with your groups and so like if you're being i think there's a whole there's so many things you can highlight to the investors i think it really just what at this point what i'm seeing in the market uh, after fundraising was that they want to make sure that you can be profitable because they don't want to be another, they don't want to back you for like 10 more years and having to continue to put fun into you because you're not profitable. Um, and two, making sure that you really are going to separate from the pack. And I actually, they told me uh, quite a few, um, like very prolific investor has said, the litmus test for a, a brand, a startup brand is that you must be able to achieve, like go past $5 million. Um, never like if can your brand scale past five million dollars in the first five years, three to five years, it takes time. If you are and if they can think if they think you can, that's when you get the money. 
it's not this like story that you're trying to tell people that you're going to be the next glossy or your things are like they don't care about the billion dollar valuation if you give it to them they'll laugh at you what you need to do to be able to showcase is the traction the metrics to that to get you to scale that shows them that you can scale past five million dollars most brand can't mm. jamie do you want to throw your two cents in here on yeah, what so investors are looking for so one, I was just thinking about this. I was helping an investment firm evaluate whether they wanted to acquire a D2C business and ratings and reviews was one of the big reasons why we red flagged it and said, don't invest in it because their D2C site actually had five-star reviews, frighteningly, all five-star reviews. So of course that looked a little sketchy. When you looked at other retailer sites, you saw 3.5 stars out of five. And that was the red flag where you, you were seeing product quality, you were seeing comments online. You can't erase those off of other retailer sites. So re reviews are really, really important for just as a proxy for product quality. And we know that Amazon and other retailer sites do a good job of tracking those. Um, for investors, I think one of the biggest things in, they're looking for is the strength of the team. And I've had so many investors, yes. venture capitalist firms, angel investors tell me they'll take an A-level team with a B-level idea nine times out of 10 versus a great idea, but it's a B-level team that they're not sure has the experience to execute. So strength of your team, sustainable sales history that Tyann was talking about. They wanna see what is your sales history and, and are you on a good realistic trajectory to, for growth? And then, then is that growth plan tied to a size of prize that is gonna be exciting to the, the investor because they wanna get paid back within you know three, five years so do they feel like they're going to get a really good return on their investment if they invest in you? Thank you. Um, I do want to take some time to address some of the questions in the chat. And just a reminder for folks um, in the audience, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. We'll do some live Q&A right now. Um, so the first question we have here is from Michelle. Uh, she's asking, how do you start the process of approaching marketplaces, maybe not Amazon, um, to see if they are open to carrying your product? And she also, as a follow-up, said, what tips do you have or things to keep in mind when you start approaching them? What resources do you need? Things like that. I can take that since this is what we do. Um, I think one of the thing is you need to ask yourself is are you retail ready? And what, and what may you mean when you say retail ready is like, do you have a presentation about your company all set to go? Do you have the assortment? Do you have the operational reach? When you, you know, if you're going to go to like third party, like Walmart, selling on Walmart and Amazon, you don't need that. But if you're going to go on to like niche, like Maisonette, um, some of the other sites, I, I can't remember the name right now, you actually have to be approved to be in there. So it's very similar to what, a re what you would normally do with a traditional retailer itself. So having, making sure that you have a retail deck ready to go um, is really important part of reaching out and it's, most of it is just sending it in to their, their info um, account. Um, if you're lucky enough and get inbounded by them, which means like they come and directly ask and reach out to you, which happens to us uh, quite a bit, um, then you have the opportunity to just uh, have that, you know, like more casual conversation itself. I would also recommend you really work on your LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn is a really interesting place, just a side note of how retailers and VCs and just regardless, like are tracking you and your company progress. Interesting. So um, that's when, how you also get inbounded. Wendy, I want to add on to what Tyann said and just be clear for Michelle for her question. There is no review process for your products when you're when you're applying to become a, a marketplace seller on Amazon or Walmart or eBay. That's another marketplace we haven't really talked about you're applying to be a reseller and then you go on and that's that and you can put whatever product you want on there. So there are more curated marketplaces like Target. Target won't just put anything up on their marketplace. Your, your application process will go through the merchant team, which will then evaluate because they're a little bit more curating in terms of what assortment they want. But if you want to sell, you know, use socks on Amazon marketplace, go at it. Like you just... <laughs> You apply to become a marketplace seller, and then you're going to figure out whether that works or not. And you pay a monthly fee to be a, a reseller on that marketplace. So just to be clear, that um, that's the yeah. beauty of being an Amazon marketplace seller or a Walmart marketplace seller. There are lots of other retailers starting to open marketplaces now where it'll be a little bit more curated. So uh, there are grocery chains that are starting to open marketplaces. So Kroger, for example, for those of you who are out 
in the, the Midwest, for example, they're, they're opening a marketplace. So uh, it depends a little bit on the category is how, how I would answer that. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, we have another question as well. So um, from Alana, I have a digital coaching company with digital sales on multiple platforms. I did not use any ad spend, but focused on social media branding. Now that I've grown vastly, I realize I need to extend my reach. Do I focus on publicity or ad spend? And she notes that she has a limited budget. So she has a challenge of focusing on where to spend her money. Do you guys have thoughts on this, where you would focus publicity or ad spend as she grows her uh, digital sales for digital coaching? So I, I have two thoughts. One, I'm just remembering another mistake that I forgot to talk about is this is an opinion, but I'd say most people in e-commerce would agree before you start spending more money on traffic, like digital advertising, if you're not set up for conversion, then that's mistake number one I see all the time mm -hmm. is, I, I mean, the, oh, yeah. the, the biggest example I saw is I, I was working with a brand that had a Super Bowl ad and it did nothing to move their sales because they weren't optimized for conversion online. That's oh, okay. an extreme example, but I see brands all the time spending thousands of dollars, tens of thousands, sometimes millions on digital advertising, on marketing, on PR firms. And then when the consumer gets to the site, they don't have enough inventory, the reviews are horrible. It's a bad technology experience or online consumer experience. You need to optimize for conversion before you start spending significant resources or even time on marketing and advertising. Uh, that said, it's kind of a little bit of, again, it's, it's this depends question on PR versus paid. It's where are you trying to drive traffic to? Do you have a good conversion rate there? From a PR perspective, do you have a differentiated story? If you can, if you can um, tell a really good story that's unique and consumers are gonna wanna buy it as soon as they hear about it, then yeah, PR sounds great. If, if you're a commoditized product and you're just trying to win share of digital shelf and digital advertising is probably a better way to go, but it, it, all, it all depends on the category and you know, what your situation is. Thank you, Jamie. That's really helpful. Um, I just wanna remind folks, you can still drop questions in the chat, um, but I did have one more question for the panelists that you guys can jump on while we wait for more questions, which is what is one takeaway that you would leave founders with? If you could give them one piece of advice to walk away from this session with, what would it be? Even if it's reiterating on something you've already said. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start. I think it's just really uh, doing the work to get feedback on your product and um, make sure it's, you know, high quality, you understand how consumers perceive it, like it, what they don't like, so that you're, you know, you just have a really strong foundational product to, to start selling. I guess that's, that's one big one. And then the other is, um, think just thinking about that customer experience and uh, are there other parts of what you're trying to do that um, can be differentiated with, with the customer experience and thinking through that from a journey standpoint. Thank you, Leslie. Jamie, what about you? So I'll, I'll, I somewhat touched on it already is that without significant differentiation, like meaningful differentiation, D2C is going to be really, really hard to build your entire business around. So if you think about really successful D2C businesses like you know, Dollar Shave or Harry's or the Bonobos of the world, those are unicorns. It's very, very rare. More often it's if you try and build your entire business around D2C and you don't have differentiation and you don't have a traffic plan, you usually end up hitting a cap and you're not profitable and it's really hard to build a sustainable company around. So I would say consider using D2C as more of an augmentation to your overarching sales strategy and not have it be the only channel that you're playing in. But again, it, it comes back to meaningful differentiation. Thank you. How about you, Tayan? I'm actually going to have like meaningful differentiation for sure. You must have that because DCC is so crowded. I, and one of the, the a good exercise is for you to take, do, um, to take pictures of every single product that you compete with and put it on a slide and see how are you differentiated against those, against the, those products. Um, because if you can't, if you can't see it clearly see a differentiation, then that means you have a lot of work to do. I, uh, the other thing is to test and get feedback 
and reiterate a lot. I mean, we talk this is mostly, you know, used in software development and things like that, but it's actually critical for you to test and get feedback so that you know you can adjust the product if it's not going to be selling well, or, you know, the price might be too high or too low, et cetera. And since when you first start out, the audience is so it's much smaller. So these changes that you make on the fly to test, they're not going to impact anybody. You, you, you can't do these type of tests when you start to have like hundreds of thousands of people coming to your website and they're like, wait a minute, it was $11 <laughs> a week ago. And now it's 12. You can't do that. Um, so I think if you can do that and test test heavily early on in your in the life cycle of your, your brand, your company, um, you'll be in a very good position. And that's where the differentiate comes in. Then you can actually tweak and really make your pr uh, products differentiated. Um, in the in the e-commerce as well as offline. Wonderful. Well, we don't have any additional questions in the chat, so I just want to take a moment here to thank all of our wonderful panelists for all of their thoughts and feedback today. Um, I know that I learned a lot, so I'm sure a lot of folks in the audience did as well. Um, I want to thank you all and then let everyone on the call know that we will be sharing this recording after the event so you can check it out again and go back to all these great learnings. Um, and we also have a variety of other events for founders coming up. So stay tuned on that Miles page for more. But thank you all so much. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. Everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye.